Hello, mental workers, and welcome back to the podcast. Today, I'm very excited because I'm sharing the microphone with Sarah O'Doherty. And today, we're going to talk to you about a very interesting topic. I'm super excited because it's all about developing an advocate identity or being a political therapist, not only with issues in the mental health profession, but with wider social justice issues. So, we're kind of going to dance around this topic and I'm very excited. Sarah is totally the right person to be speaking to about this. And let's just hear from her. So hello, Sarah. Hi, Bronwyn. So lovely to be here. Thank you. And just give us a sense of who you are. Why are we talking to you? Sure. So um, first of all, I am one of the principal psychologists and co-directors at Mindscape Psychology, uh, which is based in Sydney's Inner West. And I'm also on the board of directors for the Australian Association of Psychologists Incorporated, so the AAPI. And I've been a registered psychologist now for going on 11 years, I think. Um, And I've been on the board for AAPI for about two and a half years. I'm coming up to my three years at the end of the year. Wow. So, Sarah, you're well-placed to talk to us about having this identity and kind of having advocacy and being involved in the political space. And so I just want to jump straight into it. Can you tell us a bit about how you got involved in this space, how you added this to maybe your professional identity or or was it always there? First off, it has always been part of my identity. Um, So my cultural background is um, I'm South African and um, my family are from Cape Town in South Africa and they migrated to Australia in the mid 80s um, when apartheid was getting pretty terrible Um, and my parents basically wanted to leave South Africa because of the awfulness that was the apartheid system in South Africa. Um, My parents had been really political and had um, been part of a lot of protests um, and a lot of political activism in South Africa. And so they basically taught all of that to me. And so being in Australia, I, I can remember from a very young age going to rallies with my parents in the 90s when all of this awfulness with the refugee issue and boat people issues started to come um, into focus with John Howard as Prime Minister, um, I was very much a part of a lot of the, you know, activism to support refugees um, at the time. So that's always been a really big part of my life. Activism has always been a part of my life. So when I decided to become a psychologist, it very naturally formed a part of my professional identity because it was so much so a part of my personal identity. And I practice a lot from an acceptance and commitment therapy perspective. um, And I very much uh, use a values-based perspective. And one of the values that I often pull out when I'm talking to clients and talking to other people is the value of authenticity. And so I bring myself, my passions, my activism, my advocacy into all of the facets of the work that I do. So it's always been part of you growing up and then it almost seemed seamless. Like you were like, well, of course that's going to come with me with my psychologist identity. But I just wondered if you could cast your mind back to that, maybe to your early days of being a psychologist. Like, was there any hesitancy or pressure from kind of supervisors or workplaces to separate this identity out from yourself to kind of be like, here's me, the psychologist, and here's me, the advocate, and to kind of minimize that identity? I suppose in that sense, I've been really lucky that it hasn't been that case. So I am a very proud four plus two graduate. um, And I thought that my experiences in my plus two were second to none. So I'd gone through, you know, the Sandstone, Sydney Uni kind of stuff in my undergraduate. Then when I went through my plus two, I was basically working full time time in disability services. So I went and did all of my classes and things on the weekends and evening classes. And then I would be working full time in disability work. And it was, when was it now? Probably um, 2009, 2010, when I got into quite a lot of advocacy work in disability services as well. So 
when you're working in disability services, obviously you're going to be witness to a lot of social injustice with people who don't have anyone a lot of the time to advocate for them. So I was working primarily with adults. They were living in often group home situations or what was known as independent living situations where there would be um, support workers and carers either on the premises all the time or on the premises quite a lot of the time. And so when we were working in those settings alongside social workers and mental health nurses and other people, we would be witnessing the histories that a lot of the people that we served had undergone, a lot of the trauma, a lot of the um, abuse essentially that they had suffered. And so when we were providing them with behaviour support services, counselling, other kinds of psychological services, we would be taking into consideration all of the basically systemic oppression that this marginalised group in society had faced throughout their lives. Um, And so we would be wanting to rectify that. We would be wanting to confront that and change that in order to give that person, support that person to have the best life that they could do. So it was very much a systems approach. It was like, this can't be ignored because the system is actually part of like what they're coming to see us for and what they need help with. Is that right? Correct. And so this is You know, I I had colleagues who had been around when um, all of the boarding houses were de-evolved. So the boarding houses had been broken down in, I think, the 80s, the 90s, and even the early 2000s. And a lot of the people who had been living in the boarding houses with intellectual disabilities, with major mental health issues like schizophrenia and psychosis, they basically had nowhere to go. So they were plonked into group homes that emulated the boarding houses. And so we would hear all of these histories about what these these people had lived through. And we knew this is where everything had come from. The system had been responsible for this. It did not show a duty of care to these very marginalised and disenfranchised people. And we were now trying to rectify these massive systemic issues. Do you think that we have an obligation to address these social issues? Because the reason why I ask is because I think it could be a choice. It's like, I imagine some people would be like, nope, that's not my role. I'm a psychologist. I just do the therapy. And other people would be like, you know, like, but there's other stuff here. Like, how do you feel about that? Honestly, it's such a personal consideration. And I think that when I initially started in my work, as a psychologist, working in multidisciplinary teams, um, and particularly with people who were social workers and mental health nurses, who they have as part of their ethical guidelines, social justice embedded into it. There is that sense of, we have this obligation to understand the, the systems that have led to this person experiencing the injustices and the oppression that they have done. As psychologists, we don't have that in our ethical guidelines or in any of our professional guidelines. And so when I started, it was very much this idea of I'm an individual psychologist, I'm helping this individual in front of me. The framework that we use as psychologists is very individual. It's about the problem existing within the individual. And we're often not even taught to consider the broader context. Yeah, no, aside from being like, don't forget to add culture to your formulation. That's pretty much the extent of it. And it's like, boop, like one line. Yeah, exactly. And there's this sort of lip service to the biopsychosocial model. And I can guarantee you nobody actually knows what that means. What are we talking about in terms of biology? What are we talking about in terms of the history of the development of the psychology of that person? What kinds of social factors are we considering when we're looking at the biopsychosocial framework? So if we're looking at a much broader historical model, a systemic model, a cultural model, um, that very much digs a lot deeper into the issue. And we can often find that the issue doesn't belong to the individual person. The issue belongs to the context that they find themselves within. I guess my kind of fear in this is that 
As an early career therapist, I see injustices like everybody else. So, you know, I see Roe versus Wade being overturned and I see racial injustice and I see marriage equality being debated, people's lives and equality. And it, it motivates. It it has like a discomforting kind of thing. But then I've also been almost indoctrin- indoctrinated into this psychologist identity, which is like, you just stay within your line. You don't pay attention to that. You don't consider that. You just focus on the individual. And there's some fear, I guess, Mm. of being, uh, I won't say like maybe put down, but just kind of looked down upon maybe by other psychologists who are actually considering this. So how do, how do early career therapists kind of navigate this if they're motivated to actually attend to social injustices within the profession or outside of it, but they've got this fear, how do they actually navigate that? Big question. Sorry. No, it is. It is. And I I guess the first starting point in all of that is acknowledging that we can't ignore it. Mm. When a person in a therapy situation is coming to you for support and they are, let's say, a person of colour or they are someone who identifies as LGBTQI+, or they identify as Indigenous, something like this is going to be not just affecting them currently in their situation, but there is going to be historical influences that are either within their own history or within their family history, their cultural history, all of the systems perhaps that have come before them that have led them to be sitting there in front of you in that therapy space. If we ignore it. It's like doing them a disservice. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, there's, again, that sort of lip service that psychology kind of pays towards things like cultural sensitivity or cultural competence or whatever it is that we're calling it these days, you know, and it's like we do a one hour lecture on it and then we're supposed to be across every single minutia in all of these different cultures. And I think that Part of our job really is just listening. We're listening, we're being there with that person and we're getting a real deep feel for why they're sitting in front of us. And it's not just because they're a little bit anxious or a little bit stressed or a little bit depressed. It's because all of these other levels of potential marginalization are weighing heavy on them. I like that. I feel reassured. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> You're very what I'm, what I'm hearing is that like, if this is an authentic part of you, you don't need to worry about, I guess, kind of being looked down upon. I guess it's more important to be living by your values and kind of express that. So for listeners who do have an authentic identity where they're like, no, I can't ignore social injustices in front of me. What are some of the ways that they can actually bring that into their work? Again, it's a very depending on the person situation. So it depends on the therapist, depends on their own experiences. It depends on what they personally identify as or how they personally identify and how they identify in relation to the person in front of them, the client in front of them. You know, I identify as a person of color but I'm not going to know everybody's experiences um, from different cultural backgrounds. So my job in that situation is to humble myself and to admit that I don't know. I'd love to hear about it. I really want this person to feel comfortable enough to share with me their experiences, but I'm not going to know the answer. And I think that that's something where a lot of, particularly when I was in my early career, I always felt like I had to know the answer. And I think as I've progressed in my career, I'm far more open with not knowing. And I think not knowing a lot of the time is what the person in front of us sometimes needs. Absolutely. I find it very helpful in my early career to admit that I don't know things. It takes a lot of pressure off and considering that most of us have either self-sacrificing or unrelenting standards as our schemas. Oh, it's really taken a weight off me to be like, yeah, I don't know. And I'm willing to be humble and actually listen and learn. Absolutely. And I, I think that being able to listen and learn and actually give that 
unconditional, not just the regard, but the empathy for the person in front of us. That's our biggest skill as psychologists. We don't have to know all of the tricks of the trade. We don't have to be able to do the most amazing, you know, treatment planning and formulation, but we do have to be able to make that person feel heard and understood and willing to find their own ways forward. So I'm wondering like if we can kind of shift this maybe to like an issue uh, and I heard you say before, maybe we could apply it to climate change. Yes, definitely. Yeah. So let's say that I guess like it's all around us. We see it in the news all the time. We kind of hear about it in different countries, how climate change is affecting uh, people globally and it's displacing kind of millions of people right now and, and affecting a lot of folk. Let's say that the authenticity is part of a psychologist's identity and they're witness to this. Like, I guess maybe walk us through like maybe your experiences with navigating this. Climate change is very much a concern of mine and as it should be for everybody who's paying attention, right? Yes. Um, And I primarily work with young people and young adults. So I work with people across the lifespan, but um, my sort of core client group are young people, young adults. And this is very much at the forefront of, you know, Gen Y, Gen Zs because there's such a sense of, helplessness and hopelessness um, about their futures. They don't know where they're going to be um, and they don't know what kind of a world they're going to be inhabiting when they're, you know, my age and older. Um, And so it's about, I think, being able to acknowledge that there are problems. I think that when we go straight into therapy mode and we look at things like distress tolerance and anxiety management and, you know, behavioral activation. These are all good things, but often it's ignoring the fact that there is a problem. When we understand that there is this larger problem outside of ourselves and we feel either helpless and hopeless or we're feeling frustrated and angry, we tend to go one of two ways. We tend to either go in inwards, go into ourselves, and we feel really dejected and resigned and helpless, or we can use our anger, we can use our frustration, and we can perhaps see if there's something that we can do about it. And I very much encourage activism and advocacy for my clients who are experiencing something like eco-anxiety or helplessness and depression about their future prospects. Because if they have a sense of control and if there's something even small that they're able to take charge of and funnel their passions into, that's going to alleviate that sense of helplessness and hopelessness. It would feel very empowering. It absolutely would. Yeah. So I just, I was just kind of laughing internally to myself because I was imagining like a really invalidating approach to kind of eco-anxiety. I was like, okay, what if this young person walked in and I did a straight CBT approach and I was like, here's anxiety equation. So it's the risk over how much you think you'll be able to cope. And you know, there's not much risk to you. Like you'll be fine. And I'm sure you can deal with it. We'll give you some distress tolerance. And I could just imagine the look of invalidation (laughs) on the young person's face. Like that's done CBT or good contrast that with the approach that you're talking about. And I'm like, oh, a young person could feel very empowered by this. That's right. And I think that, you know, there's absolutely, again, there's a place for things like straight CBT. There's very much a place for things like behavioral activation, but behavioral activation, for instance, can be, let's go and find a, um, climate anxiety group in the local area and join with other young people who feel similarly where they might be able to voice their concerns and it ends with, you know, a letter to their local MP. And that is very much something that I encourage. This idea of finding your your voice and being able to use that to enact some form of change, however small. I really love it as well. I mean, this smells gels well with my own approach because I love anger as an emotion, but a lot of our clients who come into us, they often have rules that all anger is bad and it's hard to express that. You cannot express anger well. Whereas I see activism and advocacy as really like a refined expression of anger. It is like, I'm angry about this and that is a motivating force. It is very compelling and it can actually motivate you to actually do social good. So I'm just imagining for listeners 
maybe with anger, it's like, for me, it's been a real personal journey with anger. I used to be kind of, it's probably like for all women, really, it's like angry women tend to get like shoved down sort of thing. And it's like, don't, you know, engage with your anger. Um, So it's been a real personal journey, but now I love it. And yeah, I think like this is something like maybe for listeners, if they don't have, maybe if they have those similar thoughts about anger that you shouldn't express anger and that anger is bad, maybe reassess that and delve into that. I agree. Uh, And and one of the other really interesting aspects of psychology that that is one of my areas of interest is feminist psychology. Mm. And I see myself as, I think I said it on my my website bio, uh, a feminist psychologist in training because there's always more to learn. Um, So I very much believe that anger can be a tool. We can absolutely use it to move forward with things and to engage with things and to be able to enact change. Um, I would also recommend to listeners a book by Soraya Chamali called Rage Becomes Her. Um, I heard Soraya Chamali speak at one of the um, All About Women festivals at the Opera House uh, pre-COVID, and she's brilliant. If you listen to her TED Talks on anger, it's stunning. So this idea that women need to suppress their anger, we're not allowed to show anger, we're not allowed to be angry, Um, and, in fact, we actually are allowed to be every other emotion except for angry, Um, and men are allowed to be happy or angry and aren't allowed to have any other emotion. So it's a really interesting take on why we need anger. That is super interesting. I just Googled it and I'm going to link it in the show notes. So I'm excited to watch it. Thank you, Sarah. No worries. Finishing up on the climate change anxiety, it's really hammering home the point that we really need to pay attention to these systems issues and that if we don't, we can actually do our clients a disservice. And I find that very reassuring, as I said before, because a lot of like my fear in this space has been that, well, if I kind of step outside this very strict psychologist, individual focused role, that I'm, I guess I'm going to be criticized or looked down upon or looked on as less professional or kind of stepping outside my bounds. But it's actually what I'm hearing from you is that this is very well within like our bounds. I think that a lot of the time as psychologists, we feel like we're forced to lose our humanity and we are supposed to be, even now there is still this push from factions within our profession to be almost like the tabula rasa. I am a blank slate in front of the person in front of me and none of who I am as a person is going to show through my therapist mask and my therapist voice. And I think that if we don't acknowledge all of these bigger systemic issues or world global issues, then we come across as inauthentic. How can we expect to relate to someone, build rapport with someone, have a good therapeutic relationship with someone if we don't admit that, you know what, climate change affects me too. Roe v. Wade affects me too. Um, Me too affects me too. Black Lives Lives Matter affects me too. Yeah. Yeah. you know, when we were in, you know, the deepest, darkest bits of the pandemic in lockdown and we were on Zoom and clients were talking about their anxieties around COVID, we also have this responsibility to go, you know what, that actually did affect me too. But here are some ways that I've found really helpful, that the research has found really helpful that you will also find really helpful to get you through these situations. So I think being able to, obviously within boundaries, to share appropriately, to connect appropriately, these are things that I think enhance our humanity. Absolutely. It's really amazing to hear you say that because with COVID, I don't think I actually disclosed to any client like how much it was affecting me, but it absolutely was. It it affected everybody and it caused a lot of anxiety. But I feel like I'm so still in these early stages of my career. I'm so caged in that it's like I can't allow myself to even make a simple, simple, quite appropriate disclosure like that because I I was discussing it as well. And Mm. it just feels really scary. So I guess my next question is like, let's say you have somebody come to you who's an early career psych and I know, kind of similar to me. Imagine I'm coming to you and I'm like, Sarah, I don't know how to disclose even about COVID. Like I can't do this with a client. I'm so frightened that like, you know, I'll bring it to supervision and they'll be like, oh, that was an inappropriate disclosure. Is this kind of like we need a more profession, like cultural attitude shift or, or is there something that you would advise me to do? 
So when I was a provisional, one of my supervisors at the time said to keep in mind when you're thinking about self-disclosure, why disclose versus what are you disclosing? And that for me was a really helpful separation. If I thought that the disclosure would be um, therapeutically beneficial for the clients, if it was something that um, was not too revealing about my personal life, but it was about connecting with that client on that particular issue, then I think that there is definitely there's definitely occasion for appropriate self-disclosure. And it's things like general issues. You know, we were talking about lockdown and the pandemic, mask wearing um, and anxieties around mask wearing is, you know, it's still a fraught topic a lot of the time. So talking about things like, you know what, it's okay to choose to wear a mask. I sometimes wear masks in these contexts and, you know, you're sort of normalizing it for them as well. So it's not about something uh, that is, again, too deep, too personal. I'm not sharing how I feel necessarily about X, Y, Z, but I am letting them know that, hey, it is still normal to wear a mask when you're in coals because you're anxious even now, theoretically post-pandemic, even though we're not post-pandemic. Yeah, I really love that. And again, I feel reassured because it reminds me of acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, I'm trained in it as as well, probably not as extensively as you. But one of the things that I remember from my training is kind of saying to clients, like your mind is a lot like mine. Like it's really busy. It goes to all sorts of places, thoughts come in and go. And when I hear you say that, I'm like, oh, it reminds me of that. It's like, you know, your mind is a lot like mine. It's like, sometimes I think about mask wearing in different contexts and sometimes I do this and it's massively normalizing for clients to hear that. So they don't feel so alone. Like their brain is a freak. It's like, no, your, your brain is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. Absolutely. And again, you know, I think that there is that push for psychologists to not talk about issues that they are personally affected by. And how could we not be affected by Mm. a global pandemic and, you know, rolling lockdowns? Like we're not superhuman. We're not, (laughs) you know, Teflon coded. We are very much in this with our clients. And I think that it would be a disservice to them to think that or let them think that we are either above it or we're better than them because we have somehow survived it unscathed. Um, You know, it's a scary time for everyone. So I think being able to, again, humble ourselves and let people know this is something that has affected me. It's affected people that I know and care about in the same way that it's affected you and people that you know and care about. Sarah, I've learned so much from this conversation and I found it really validating. And I really appreciate you sharing your experiences about how being an advocate, being involved in political issues has been part of your identity growing up. I wanted to ask you whether you wanted to leave listeners with anything kind of final to say, like any last takeaways. I think that my goal in my career as a psychologist now is very much about integrating various aspects of who I am with my therapy. And I think that it's taken me a really long time to feel comfortable with all of these different aspects of my identity in the therapy space. And I think I want to let people know that it's okay to own these things. It's okay to let people know this is who I am. This is the kind of therapist that you are booking in with, that you are going to be doing therapy with. And it's also okay for people to say, you know what? No, that is not the therapist that I want. You know, her hair's too pink. She's too political, whatever it might be. And that's fine. I probably don't necessarily need to work with that person. And they're probably going to find a different therapist who might be a better fit for them. But I think that the the clients who seek me out as a therapist want to work specifically with the identity that I 
present because they feel as though they are going to benefit not just from the therapy space, which let's be honest, any old psychologist can do CBT with any client. They are going to benefit specifically from therapy with this therapist. And I think as we progress in our careers and we become more comfortable with ourselves and with the therapists that we're all still becoming, because it all is a journey, right? Then we're going to be able to be more authentic in our therapy spaces. Beautiful. Thank you, Sarah. I like, I don't often, I just, I just feel really inspired. It's just really nice to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pleased. That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really, sh- I really think the listeners will find this very helpful because I do think that professional identity and kind of in this regard is a really big thing for us. So thank you again. And is there anywhere that listeners can go to if they want to find out more about you or your work? Um, so at the moment, um, there's a little bit about me on the Mindscape Psychology website, which is just mindscapepsychology.com.au. And I'm going to be starting a podcast with one of my brilliant colleagues, Avril Cook. Oh, um, awesome. She is spectacular and her um passion area is decolonizing psychology. And The podcast is going to be called Dismantling Psychology, and that is in the process of being recorded now. So I can let you know when that hits the airwaves. Lovely. We would love to know because I'm also interviewing Avril coming up as well. So I've got something to do with her. So listeners, yeah, something to look forward to. And we will be talking about decolonizing psychology. So I'm sure it will come up in that in that conversation. So I'm very excited for you guys. And I would definitely link to that in the show notes when it does come out. Thank you so much again, Sarah. I really appreciate it. And thank you listeners and catch you later. Bye.